Well, I am so happy to be with you today. Um, and, and like you said, I do pastoral counseling for Samaricare Counseling Center, and then I'm the clinical director for our northern offices, and that our offices are here in your church, so that's really wonderful to get to be with you this morning. Um, we also have the western um, focus is in Naperville, so it's a pretty big footprint now for Samaricare Counseling Center. Um, and I do see individuals and couples, and and I see people in person in Evanston and here, here on Thursdays, Mondays in Evanston, and then online every weekday, because most people are still preferring online, um, but, but some want to be in person, and that's great. We want to provide that for those who do. Um, and then I lead a grief group twice, uh, twice a year, and there's going to be one starting next week here, in, in this coming Thursday, here in Winnetka Congregational Church on, in the evenings. 7 to 8.30 for eight weeks. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that starting. This, this grief group is supported by your church and Kellenworth Union Church and Christ Church um, in Winnetka. And that makes it allowed to be free for people. Anybody who wants to be in the group can and can benefit. And we're so grateful for that. This has helped so many people through the years. It's, it's really a good thing. Um, is there a remote option for that? Or no. There, there isn't right now. Oh, I'm see, just curious. I just know some of that might benefit. Yeah. The group I lead in that starts in February will be online. Okay. Again. This is the first time since COVID started that we're doing it in right. person. So, like that. so that's kind of huge. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that. Um, it, before that, it was in person. but And we'll, we will do the January, well, January, February ones will be online for someone who would prefer that. Um, so I've been doing counseling throughout the pandemic and mostly sessions online until last February when it started to seem safe to, to do them in person. And um, I wanted to share some of what we found to be helpful for people as, as we're all coping with what was completely unprecedented with a worldwide pandemic. And now moving through the third year of dealing with COVID because it's not over yet and, and its effects on people. Um, though the isolation has been less this year, people are, are able to get out more. There's still a lot of people that are, are having problems coping with it. Um, so I, um, I got some information from Mental Health America. Um, this, is, this is very interesting. They publish a report every year on the state of mental health in America. And this is from their 2023 report. And their key findings mean that 21% of adults are experiencing a mental illness in America. So that's one in five people, more than one in five. And um, that would be about 50 million Americans that are dealing with a, a mental illness right now. Um, and 55% of those adults, over, over half, receive no treatment for their mental health, their mental illness. And, and half of that group state that it's because they just couldn't afford it. So it's stunning, you know. And they state that in the U.S. there are 350 um, individuals for every one health provider. 350 individuals needing treatment for every one health provider. And then I looked up, they break out by state. Illinois is better than most states. We're 370 to one. Um, like some of the states are 850 to one. You know, so that's that's um and it's it explains why we get so many calls to it. That's America. We've had a waiting list and we never did before. Um and so and the numbers for youth are high too. Um 16% of our youth reported suffering from at least one major depressive episode in the past year. The major depressive episode, that's a big deal, you know. Um, and that's more than 2.7 million youth experiencing severe American major depression. And 60% of these kids do not get treatment. So, and that's just major depression. That didn't even count anxiety disorders. And we know that for adults, even um, that between 2019 and 2020, so that's the year COVID hit, the anxiety disorders ramped up from 11% to 40% in the, in the United States. So, um, so next week, um, uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Ch Char Slezak, is going to come and talk about youth. She works entirely or almost entirely with youth and young adults. And so she's going to come and talk about working with how to support our youth 
through this pandemic and beyond now um, that will be for next next week. So, but I wanted to talk this morning about trauma um, because I think we've all been through what counts as trauma in some significant ways. And I wanna talk about resilience and the ways our faith can be an incredible gift to us. And I hope that you will find something that I share to be of help to you and hopefully maybe several things and that would be great. So that's one thing. I'm gonna move over here so I can look at the slides. The first slide is in here. Okay. Yeah. Is it on Right. Oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, stop down. Nope, that no, would be right. Okay. Um, this one? Yeah, great. That one's fine. Did you do it? Down the corner, see this? Right? Yeah, left? Right, you click on, on, okay. Right here. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Okay, so I want to start off with prayer and a prayerful meditation that I find extremely useful whenever I'm being stressed. And it's really good for when you want to calm yourself or if you're having trouble going to sleep, you wake up in the night, you can't go back to sleep or, or you're trying to regain a sense of grounding and what is important. And you don't have to be in charge of everything. God is in charge. Um, so this comes from the scripture, Psalm 46. Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I think that's a one pretty familiar to us. Be still and know that I am God. And, and what you do is keep repeating it. Um, but each time you emphasize the next word in the phrase. And every time you do that, it shifts the meaning a little bit and helps you to see it in a new light. Welcome. So when you get to the end of the phrase, then you would go backwards, emphasizing the previous word back to back to the beginning. But we're just going to go to the end of the first to the end, and then I'll I'll, I'll close with a prayer because I want to help you understand how to do it. But then you can do that on your own. So um, so I'm just going to go forward. So let's just try to get comfortable. You can close your eyes if you want to. Um, try to be somewhat prayerful, <clears throat> and take a take a big breath and then let it out. Take another nice breath and breathe out. And another one. And breathe that out. Okay. And then we'll do the meditation. So be still. But just let me do it. You just experience it. Okay. Be still and know no, that I am God. Be still and know 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 that I am God. Let us continue my prayer. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this time together today. I thank you for each person here and ask your blessing on each of us. Please move in our hearts that our thoughts and our words be acceptable in your sight and help us to learn and grow together. Empower us, God, as we seek to grow in faith and respond with your light to our struggles. We thank you for Reverend Phillips and Reverend Mothershed, for Patty and Greg and Kai and all their guidance and expertise helping this time together to be so good for us today. Please guide all of us as we do our best to present to one another, both here in the room and online this morning. May it be a time of growth for all. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're moving through the third year of the pandemic. And, and so I wanted to start by talking about thinking about trauma and stress and even chronic stress, because it became chronic stress about a year into it. And resilience responses. Next slide. 
Great. And then one more. Um, Basil Van der Kolk is a world-renowned trauma expert, um, and he spent his whole career on, on seeking to help people um, deal with, cope with, heal from trauma. And he hosts a worldwide summit every year on trauma as the latest things that we know. He wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And near the beginning of the pandemic, when we were starting to realize what we were up against, he shared some very helpful information regarding trauma. He said, when one is in the midst of trauma, there are two predominant features. Okay, the first one is lack of a sense of control, so feeling helpless. And the second one is uncertainty as to when it will end and no end in sight. So lack of control and uncertainty when it's going to end. No, we don't know when it's going to end. Those are the main two main features of trauma. And then, and so we were in, we were having both of those going on with with, with COVID. Um, and he considered us all to be in a state of, of trauma to some degree. So he had some very helpful suggestions. I started telling them to every one of my clients. Um, so his suggestions are. Um, <coughs> the next one, we get from that, uh, and that one. Um, two recommendations. So establish a routine to the point of it being boring for, for your day. You have a routine that you do every day. And, and this gave a sense of control and grounding. Right? Did you do that? Good. And then exercise in a way that helps you feel your strength, like yoga or working with weights, something that helps you feel your strength. And that could give a sense of, of strength and effectiveness. So those are the two, two things he was lifting up as we were trying to cope. And those are two things that you could control, right? And there were things that you could do. Um, so then, and thinking about other ways that we could respond constructively to stress, <clears throat> I wanted us to look together at, at one take on the nature of stress and how we can respond. So that's what this slide's about. When we have adequate resources to meet the demands that we're facing, then life is good. We don't, we don't feel stress, right? When we don't have what we need to meet demands, that's when, when we feel stress. And um, maybe we're afraid we won't have enough of what we need, um, like time to do what we must, or enough resources, or like when everyone was worried about toilet paper and handy wipes, remember that? It's incredible. <laughs> or bigger issues like finances. People were worried about keeping their jobs and how they're going to work from home, how they're going to help their kids have school. Um, we feel even, um, we feel fear and even panic sometimes. That's where st that stress. Um, but stress can also be an opportunity for growth and recognition of our limits and need for care. Can we see through that? So stress is a normal part of life. We have to have some, we function well with some stress, right? A certain amount is healthy and keeps us motivated and excited. And it also does help to see what our limits are and what our needs for care are. So what are some things we can do when the stress is too high? There should be another one now. We can re reduce the demand by setting boundaries, limits, choosing choices that increase our balance. Um, and the other thing we can do is, is increase our resources. So we can do self-care things and spiritual and social support. And the spiritual and social support is in part three of this presentation. You have that here and that's awesome. Um, but so you, the two things you can do is try to re reduce the demand by setting mm -hmm. boundaries that are manageable and increase your resources. So I hope, um, so I hope that you can think about your own self-care as a priority, and I brought a handout called My, My Self-Care Chart and Possibilities, which is in front of you on the table. This one, you can find that. Um, and it's a good one, and I thought you could take that home with you and, and spend some time with it. And for, for anyone who's online, just um, send me an email. The next screen is going to have an email for you on it, or, or let Patty know, and we'll send you one of these. 
and it's a good so there's things on there that probably would surprise you or that when you think about it up here like i love the one about laugh seek something that will make you smile and laugh <laughs> i mean that the sitcoms that had comedy on them were quite popular during COVID, right? You need, to, and this laughing helps you helps you so much to feel better. Um, join or create a support network or group, journal, all, all, all good things. And maybe you're already doing a lot of these things, and maybe you might want to add one or two to your, your things that you do. But those are helpful things that you could do for your own self-care. Can you show that next slide for, for whoever's online? Nope. Okay, anyway, well, never mind. It's, back. <laughs> it's not there, I guess. Oh. It's not there, but okay. Uh, just okay. keep going. Okay. okay. Um, I think I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. Um, this is a definition of self care from Parker Palmer. I don't know if you ever read any of his books, they're, they're wonderful. He's a Quaker, he was a president of a college. He's so um, gifted and and he lifts up that self-care is never a selfish act. People think it's selfish to be caring about yourself. It's simply good stewardship of the only gift I have, the gift I was put on earth to offer to others. Caring for ourselves helps us care for others. Anytime we can listen to true self and give it the care it requires, we do, we do so not only for ourselves, but for the many others who, whose lives we touch. Um, and uh, it, it's so important, you know, and if you think about love, love when in love, we just said to love others as we love ourselves, it presumes that we love ourselves. We always hear, love your neighbor, love your neighbor, you know, but it, it, it presumes you are taking good care of yourself. And then your cup's full, you can, you can look, extend that to your neighbor, right? And then the next slide, we, even Jesus says, um, Come apart and rest for a while. So this is where I meant to have we have you look at the self-care chart. <laughs> okay, the next one is why it's so important. And there's my email um, for someone online. If you want me to send you a copy of the self-care chart, I will be happy to do that. And if you don't have email, we can send it to you in the mail. Just let the office know. We'll be glad to. Okay. Okay. So now I want to shift to resilience, okay? Because in brief review, we've considered when, when we're in chronic stress, we pay attention to our routine, the structure of our day, we can exercise and, and in ways that help us feel our strength and we can be very intentional about our self-care, right? And I want us to also think about resilience because resilience is not something you are just born with. Um, it, it's, it can be cultivated. Let's, let's look at what the American Psychological Association has to say about resilience. And here it is. After a particularly painful, difficult, or even traumatic time, people react differently. It is natural to have a flood of thoughts, intense emotions, and feelings of instability. People generally adapt well over time to life-changing situations and stressful situations, in part thanks to resilience. Not everyone develops PTSD after a trauma, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Lots of people don't. And it has a lot to do with resilience. Okay. Stop listening. Um, so re resilience is defined as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, et cetera. This is still from the American Psychological Association. And one more, please. As much as it involves bouncing back from these difficulties, it can also involve profound personal growth. So resilience can actually generate growth. You smiling? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's look at let's look at what resilience isn't. It it isn't. Being, being resilient doesn't mean that a person won't experience difficulty or distress. Almost everybody does. It is likely that one will have considerable emotional distress in our lives, okay? Being resilient isn't a personality trait that only certain people possess. We'll say somebody is really resilient and that's great, but it's everybody. It involves thought and actions that anyone can learn and develop. 
So that's very important that it's something anyone can develop and it's really a good idea to work on work on your own resilience. It's, it's really positive. People cannot just heal from trauma, but they can grow and can have growth. And you may have experienced some of that already um, in your life. Um, okay, the next one. Um, this is one more, you oh, good. The, the, there's been a lot of research done on people that went through trauma mm -hmm. and um, these two guys, Richard Tedeschi and Lawrence Calhoun of the University of North Carolina in Charlotte, study how people responded to traumatic events, right? All kinds of traumas. And they found that fewer than 15% develop PTSD. Okay? That's, you'd think it would be higher than that. More than 50% experience one positive change. And one more. Some growth can actually occur in five areas, and they, they notice the patterns of where people did grow through from going through trauma. And then it's five areas they left up. So we'll look at these five areas now. After trauma, both growth can come in five forms. Forming deeper relationships, um, discovering more meaning in life, finding personal strength, gaining appreciation, and seeing new possibilities. All right? Okay, those are the five. I'm going to go through each one briefly. So, in that slide, mm -hmm. please. Forming deeper relationships. Um, what kind, what, how could that, those deeper relationships be formed? What, what are some ways they lift up support groups? I mean, about coming to a group like this. Um, 12 step groups. Lots of 12 step groups were well attended during the online, and they work online, it worked for people. Covenant groups, book groups, Bible study groups, counseling, um, mentoring, spiritual direction, I think there's one more, and intergenerational relationships. I think a lot of this was we were able to be with our family a whole lot more. And like I moved to Michigan to take care of my dad because he was 90 and he was in a wheelchair by himself. And I was doing online counseling. So I'm sitting in Evanston in an apartment by myself, you know, and I thought if I'm there, I could I at least could make sure he eats well and we have better company for each other. And it, it, that was actually kind of a blessing for us um, to have that time together that we wouldn't have had normally. Um, I think a lot of intergenerational things were, were maybe happening more. Um, okay. The second one is discovering more meaning in life. And they lift up spiritual practices as, as one way, um, how we find more meaning. Uh, another is um, is quoting um, Viktor Frankl. And these two quotes are from him. I don't know if, if you've ever read his book, Man's Search for Meaning, but if you haven't, it's really great. Um, I, I was uh, had to read it in college for um, my psychology. And... I had one What? Did you say that? Is that a question? Victor Frankel was the name. Okay. And uh, um. Anybody understand that? No. Okay. That's hard to create to not to not see. Yeah. Okay. Speak up here if you have any questions. Yeah. Um. I taught, I taught psychology at Elmhurst College and I, and I had each of the kids read, read this book too because it's just so profound. And he he was already a psychoanalyst when he went into a concentration camp um, in, in, during World War II. So he was noticing how people responded and who lived and who didn't live. And the ones who lived were the ones who had something important yet they wanted to do or someone they were living for or some way that they could see meaning um, going forward in the midst of this. And so these two quotes are from him that who has a why to live can bear almost any how. <laughs> and in some way, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds meaning. Um, and people find their, their own sense of meaning and what's happening, you know, and why. And it's, it's a really excellent book if you haven't read it. <laughs> It's, it's old now, but it's really good. Um, so let's look at the next one. Um, growth 
area, possibility, strength, and wellness. Um, and these are bullets to believe that you can recover and grow. Look for examples of recovery in others. Um, read inspirational stories. Look to path examples of success and overcome obstacles. Consider what you value as some of your own personal strengths. So um, all of those are really important and you could think about those. The fourth form in which growth can, can, can come would be in gaining appreciation. You can do the next one, please. You're great. Um, and there's three three areas for gaining appreciation. Gratitude practices and lists. Any, anyone who makes a gratitude list, every time you're in gratitude, you're not in stress. So gratitude is a great practice. And it, you know, a huge thing in our theology, um, um, Calvin thought that the first thing that we, we do would be to be grateful for what God has done and fall on our knees and gratitude and then share that love with the world. So I just, that was just reminded of that in a moment. Um, it's a great practice. Appreciate the beauty in yourself, in art, in music, etc. And look at the art in the everyday. And I think finding beauty and hope was really important for me during the really intense first two years of COVID. And as I sat with clients online every day and looking after my dad. So it helps me a lot to be in nature, to feed the birds and the deer and tend the flowers um, and see as many sunrises as possible. So I tended the flowers that my mom started so many years ago. She's been gone for 11 years, but her flowers are still there, the perennials. And I looked after them and it really helped me to nurture them. And I was thinking of that in light of this idea of looking for beauty. I'm going to see if this will work. You press right here. Yeah, down here. You can move it around. Just make sure you're on that right arrow. Okay. Just keep clicking going. Thank you. Thank you. So check this out. These are. These are morning glories um, over a summer that um, I helped that she always grew the morning glories and they went up uh, two columns and then they met at the top. We were trying to see if they could meet across the top and they did. And they're just so beautiful. Um, and here's one close up. I don't know if you ever looked at one and, and there's a five point star inside every morning glory. Um, just <laughs> really pretty. And then here's another. Me, it's an example of art. This is this is on uh, Lee Street Beach this week. This um, a morning sunrise. Um, went for a walk, and somebody made a castle just for everyone to enjoy. Beautiful. Isn't that cool? Yeah. It, every so often, there's a castle out here. They're, they're so cool, and it seems like public public art to me, and, and a, a generous gift for for anyone who can enjoy it. No. Um, I want to ask you to, if you think for a minute on on what where have been you've been finding beauty for art? Um, what's your favorite music? Have you found something cool on the internet lately? Um, was there something you really appreciated this summer, like a trip or a sunrise or a performance? Um, it, it's important to take note of the blessings that are all around us. And if you just think about that, hold that thought for a minute, and, and we'll share about that maybe. Um, and I wanted to give a fifth area for possible growth for resilience too. And it's in seeing new, seeing new possibilities. Um, <coughs> there are areas for growth that, that one can, can access to build resilience, right? So sometimes it's a career peak pivot. We've seen a lot of people pivot through the pandemic um, or a change in their um, way of doing things, changing a career path or lifestyle pattern. A lot of people are working remotely from home. Um, we have done that. Um, grief, if you had a loss during COVID or at any time there's a loss, it requires a degree of restructuring in, in your life. <laughs> At Seneca, um, he said, every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. So, there's wisdom in that. 
And and maybe it doesn't even have to be something new, um, something major, maybe just trying something new. Um, but personally, when I think about new beginnings, I think about sunrises and and I think about when I see sunrises a lot about new beginnings. And so I did a slide for you on sunrises. Um, here's one in Evanston at the Lee Street Beach again. And that's near where I live, if you can figure that out. <laughs> and um, in Michigan, at, at my dad's house, um, I would walk in the mornings and I saw a lot of sunrises that way and they're beautiful. And I don't know if you ever thought about it, but Chicago and um, Evanston and Winnetka and Keegan, they're all built on the lake facing east. You know, so you can see the sunrise, and there's hope in that. It, sunrises in the west are, sunsets are nice too, but the sunrise has that potential for the, all the possibilities in the day. Um, and then I have another first to share. Um, I received a KitchenAid uh, mixer for my birthday, and um, and I'm really crazy about the great, great British baking show that helped me get through COVID a lot. And so I'm trying to learn how to make fancy cakes this year. So this is the first effort at a Victoria sponge and a Battenberg um, cake. So <laughs> and it's been, you know, it's been a source of joy and creativity and um, really good for me to, to, to try that. Um, so I know that's a lot of material and I'm just gonna do a fast review that after trauma growth can come in five forms, forming deeper relationships, discovering more meaning in life, finding personal strength, gaining appreciation, and seeing new possibilities. So if you can you think in any ways through this pandemic that you have been growing, or or maybe you could focus on some growth in any of these five areas, um, or if you could name some personal strengths that could be really cool. And I met Chris to, you know, work in pairs for a few minutes, but we can just maybe do it as a group. And if you want to share anything that's been coming to mind for you um, as we've been going through these areas, um, or if, or where you have seen beauty or art or new beginnings, what whatever has been meaningful for you. Anybody had any thoughts? Well, I find that um, no matter what I've said has sparked my interest at the moment, I can't get off of it. And then, uh, so I will go through a little of it and get so excited about it. You know, an hour has passed. And I, I find, I wish I could, I'm a perfectionist and I want to be able to be an expert in that before I move on to something else. Yeah. Of course. 12 hours later, it's something new. Okay. And this is, uh, I had a point, now I've forgotten it, but this is an amazing thing that that I find that I can get excited yeah. and happy over thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you brought that out. I mean, I wish I, I've never understood <clears throat> anything as clearly as after you speak, have spoken now. Okay. All of these phrases that define our growth is something that I've experienced in a way that I never realized the depth of it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Can, great. I, can I jump in briefly? Yeah. That would be great. Please do. Um, I would have to say every, uh, virtually every slide you put up in your PowerPoint, I said, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. Okay. For those of you, you who don't know, I've lived with a life of a progressive chronic disease oh. that has robbed me of my ability to use my body. I used to be a, an aerobics queen, and now I sit in a wheelchair unable to use my arms or legs wow. and I'm thriving good for you wow. and so many of the points that you raised along the way 
have become, I've embodied those practices. I've embodied those attitudes. Um, things like suffering. I have pain every day and yet I don't suffer because I have meaning. Ah, uh, okay, great. I find ways every day to inject laughter and joy and gratitude into my life. I rediscovered drawing for a while and I went through a flurry of drawing a whole bunch of different designs and artwork, which now hang in my home. Um, wow. And I, you know, I've given a few talks in that in this program about gratitude and joy, um, and and I am resilient as a result of all of this. Um, yes, you so sound very resilient. I'm the poster child for it does work. <laughs> okay that's great <clears throat> thank you for sharing that, that that's wonderful you, you sound you do sound like incredibly resilient that's great can you tell me your name please because i don't know it it's js js okay awesome thank you okay anyone else um yeah hey, uh, my name is john john jameson and yeah. um uh, I, I, Carol is a PhD psychologist. Oh, also, wow. So, uh, okay. So she, she's been agreeing with everything. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. 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 Um, um, but but I, I have a question that sort of goes beyond this. Yes. And that is okay, there are all these all these people, like, like for example, in, in Chicago. Who are having these difficult times? I mean, you have yeah. you, you, hear, you hear these kids. You know, mom and dad goes off for work, and the kids have nothing to do but to go enjoy a game and and shoot each other. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we could do to you know help them live more healthy lives and not end up uh, dead or in, in prison or something like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. A great very challenge. Sure. It yeah, challenge. it is a challenge. I think a lot of it has to do with hope. They a lot of those kids just don't have, have it, you know? oh, yeah. so, and yeah. the, the resources that they have available are I mean, I even for the teachers, the teachers don't have a lot of yeah. hope and they yes. you know, and they sort of give up on the kids. I think yes. they give up the kids, the parents don't have any hope. I mean it, mm -hmm. I think that they just you know, they just have, they can't see it. They don't experience it. They don't experience uh, life is so difficult. But I was thinking also about um, one of your slides earlier. Mm -hmm. The African American community, I think, really grew in terms of spirituality very deeply because of the trauma they went through. Yeah. That was the only thing that really helped, I think. The it's community, going, right? That, and it yeah. formed the community, and but the spirituality is very, yeah. very deep. Yeah, in that particular community, it remains very deep. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, some of those kids in the Chicago area don't. You know, uh, not, they're not connected to a church, right? right. But, yeah, but that's a great, great point, and mm -hmm. yeah, and it leads into the, the next, next part of the faith factor that I want us to be able to. Think about and claim because um, it's it's uh, so important. And um, we are not alive. My understanding, for instance, from Richard Rohr is that you really that 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 this kind of trauma and stress is really helpful in terms of reaching a different level of spirituality. Uh, yeah. Well, Richard Rohr has a uh, a member of his faculty named um, Barbara Holmes, mm -hmm. and she specializes in what she calls crisis contemplation. Mm -hmm. Crisis drives us to contemplation. Mm -hmm. I can. Yeah. Contemplation? contemplation? Contemplation. The ability to go within, look within, look. find strength, find God, etc. And that this can explain why my uh, communities 
including sexual minority communities, LGBTQ+, plus, have a depth of spirituality that it can be remarkable right. because of growing up with that sense of trauma <laughs> and exclusion from society. So, yeah, I don't know if Richard does that, but Mm -hmm. well, yeah. I've read, I, I Barbara, Barbara Holmes, but he, quotes, he quotes her. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so those of us who live in a very easy world are you know, mm -hmm. somehow we're protected from all the stress, from but we don't have the opportunity maybe for growth that we might have if we had ah. yeah. additional, additional challenges. Additional it's challenges. an interesting thing to think about. But. Mm -hmm. the, and then the idea that uh, 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 just to follow through, then then you have an appreciate, then you can say it's a gift, it's coming, it's there for you it, because it's a human, um, it's it's part of being a human being. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to think is, how do I get through to a grandson who stays in his room in college and does never never leaves his room, but is getting good grades, and but he has no ability to see another side or to get another view. Yeah. That and what's causing all that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And part of that is COVID, probably because kids were forced, and and some kids that that helped if they already had anxiety that. Some kids kind of flourished under that, but they didn't get the social yeah. connection that normally the teenagers connection. really need and, and, and gain during those years. So it, it's an important concern. Okay, I want to, um, so so the next section is on the big factor, and I wanted to talk about that um, too, because we have something special as faith communities that is unique and wonderful. And it, it's a little bit what I mean, it's something that you were touching on there too with the African American communities and their spirituality there. But, um, and I know that you have it because you're here. Um, so, but did you know that if you have a faith, you live longer? Um, research has proven that. Uh, the, there's a wonderful study that was done in California. Of 5,286 Californians over 28 years. Um, and in any given year, frequent attenders of a faith tradition were 36% less likely to have died in that year. <laughs> there you go. And they're likely to live eight years longer than the general population. Religious involvement rivals non smoking and exercise effects. Mm -hmm. Which I think is significant. I would have that part of that is not related to just the connection, the the social connection. Yes, 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 yes. I would think that's, that's a great thing. Not the religion itself. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. Right. I mean, it's an interesting thing. That's what they were trying to figure out. You know, you, it's like you were talking about community, uh -huh. uh, and we have we have uh, people here know that we have a a. a and a house up in up in Michigan, and um, yeah. and when, when you're when you're in in, in, our, in that we're, we're, it's on an island in the lake, small we're, community, we're, small town. But when we when we are driving, you know, well, uh -huh. Carol's driving. I don't have a driver's license anymore. <laughs> but she's driving. Car coming this way. You wave. You do. And okay. They wave, and because they're going to be waving anyway. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we are, we are a, a community. Awesome. Yeah. Well, beyond the beyond that, if you stop in on the oh, road, yeah. if you like, one time I stopped on the road. To yeah. Get a picture. Oh. Everyone, someone will always stop and say, "Do you need? Are you help? okay? Wow, oh, that's great. That's incredible. Yeah. And that's I had awesome. to, last week I had to take a taxi. There's the only one taxi driver on the island. I didn't have any. And I get two dollars to my name because I don't need any money on the island. But anyway, I took the taxi with two other guys. We shared the ride. And one guy I got in and paid huh. for the fare. Oh my gosh. Wow. And I tried to pay my share and she said, No, he's already taken care of it. Oh, that's, that's great. Cool. She could have easily taken another. Yeah. Come out for me. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's, wonderful. it's interesting. I and think that because it's the, you. the small community and it, you know, feel really connected. Yeah. 
Everybody take care of everybody that. else all the time. We need that. We bet. We I just lost my sister so, last year. Oh. And yeah. um, the community that we have in my country uh, is building me up. Even Great. More. And I had, now I've, I've had some different perception towards life. <clears throat> yeah. I've accepted death as it is. I've uh, suffered death a few times, but her death has brought some kind of level of acceptance and reality to life. Yeah, I and bet. with the community, uh, the way our place is, you cannot be in your uh, house one day and not come out and nobody coming in to see what why you are not. Why not? What's going on? With that you? Yes. That's great. So, so it's a, an, an, it's, um, like an automatic wellness check. Yeah. Yeah, you, wake you don't up, have to call the police. You say, you they say just hello come to your neighbor. Yeah. So if you've gone past the morning, if not heard good morning from you, uh -huh. they will come and check. Great. That is and awesome. It's a very, very, very caring community. Great. And it's that holds everyone like you. It's like it's okay. But here, when yeah. you just, just trying to know them, they go. But, Mm -hmm. Are you the police or something? Why are you investigating, interviewing me? <laughs> right, right. They might. Uh, uh, the, the New York Times had an article about Bahrain. Uh, that it's. I have. I think I have the right country. There's elephants and there's Hinduism and uh, there's there are Muslims. And so I'm not sure about what religion it is. Jeffrey's reading, so he won't be able to answer this, but. <laughs> He's leaving for a reason. <laughs> yeah. But the uh, idea was that this is a country that has the same environment, like elephants and tigers, that Africa has. And in Africa, these animals are suffering, and the environment is uh, yeah. is is suffering, climate, etc. They have the same climate problems, but the community is a, is is joined together through their religious mm -hmm. ideas, which is similar to the American Indian, where they everything is based on nature sharing. and sharing and helping others. So that the the elephants, they're they're they're, they're hundreds of elephants. <laughs> they're not endangered, <laughs> right? Great, and and there that that is like your little island. Yeah, it's the like same it. thing where they they all get along. Okay, that's awesome. Yep, it's a whole different theology. Yes, and that's what was interesting with this study that um they found that you're healthier if you have a tradition that you're that you're a part of, and um you're likely to have a healthier immune function, with fewer hospital admissions. Um, for AIDS patients, there were fewer stress hormones and longer survival. Um, and they were trying to understand why, okay? Um, because this is psychology looking at it. It's, it's not theology, right? So um, they say, well, we have healthier lifestyles um, and social support that satisfies that need to belong. But they did not think this was enough to indicate these remarkable results regarding stress. Um, and so then they, they came up with four more conclusions um, that, that we have stress protection and an enhanced well-being associated with, this is people who are, are worshiping in some tradition, some religious tradition, um, a coherent worldview, a sense of hope for the long-term future, feelings of ultimate acceptance, relaxed meditation of prayer and Sabbath observance. Those would all tend to be there for a person. And yeah, a coherent worldview, right? We do. We have these things. We do. It comes from God, our relationships with God, and one another in community. All, all four of those things do. Um, psychology can't really lift up what informs our coherent worldview, right? But theology can. And that's just where you're hitting the difference there with the theology for Bahrain. Um, we have a relationship with God who is real and very present in our lives through our faith, our worship, and our interactions with one another. Just one second. Okay. We know we are ultimately accepted and loved no matter what we are going through, and that can make a very, very big difference in how we cope. Okay. Yeah. yeah I think that some of that is because people are in 
where I live in, in other areas, I've been going across, going on Metro, been on the bus, yeah. I've been everywhere, and they are just so aggressive and uh, trying to prove the Bible to be true. And I was, someone was saying, with well, Gabriel, where's Gabriel, Michael, all the archangels, and then what they do, they create more evil and have to run through evil. And, and but they can't prove anything about the angels. They can't find them, so they put everybody in rage. You oh. know, because they they never made it. They they fought as far as they were gonna go, and they never made it. The Creator, God, whatever, they crucified them, but they don't have any churches over yet. So they're trying to make it be somebody. Mm -hmm. And I told someone they teach me about the um, Islam faith and all this and that. I said, well, they, I heard through the great lines. That they sneak while they're in war. They sneak and look and peek and see if there's the history of the faith um, of the Bible. And then what they do is they bomb them up. Everybody bombs them up and soldiers leave out lambs and things. Then they lay on call from the Bible. You know, mm -hmm. I said, no, I have to advice from people and they get out of it. And I told people, I said, well, just don't, just don't do the military again. If y'all just over there looking and searching and peeking. Okay. You know? You know, yeah. you have to teach them to have freedom of their rights of religion to, to serve if they don't feel uncomfortable and they don't like the Bible that's passed them in the military, then don't go in the military, don't go right. in the military. Right. You know, don't yeah. put your, your life on the line like that. Yeah. You bet. You bet. That's complicated. Yeah. Okay. And then last slide here. I, I want us to just think about that. We have resources in our faith. Um, those resources are our beliefs, our practices, and, and a sense of community. Um, and to think about that a bit because it's it's significant. What we can see why it's so important when the pandemic hit and we couldn't meet in person, that we strove to get worship to work online, you know, and we were bringing resources to the kids. We were, we were so worried for them and doing everything we could to keep that connection with our God and one another vibrant. As it is so important, um, you're here today because of when I Congregational Church, and I bet you moved through the pandemic um, this last three years much better than many because of this church. You know, um, so our scripture gives us so many resources. One, one that has meant so much to me through the years is is um, and what did in the pandemic is Romans 38 verse nine. Paul says, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God's love, not even a pandemic, you know. So um, my pastor shared in a sermon about resilience that she has realized that in her lowest moments, there have been angels helping in the form of other people. Um, that reached out for her and Angel that was there to pay for the taxi um, this week, you know, and they gave and and that gave or or they gave her another perspective or they listened, you know. So I hoped we could think a little bit about that and like who's been an angel to you or who you've been an angel to. But I know we're not going to have time. We're going to have to to stop. But you could still think about that and and maybe share with one another. Um, or what scripture has been most important to you, or even a hymn, has there been a hymn that has been really important to you? Because all of those things are part of our community life together. Um, um, again, we really are going to have to stop. But um, does anybody have one thing they want to share about that? There was a time in my life where none of this would have made any sense. <laughs> all right. If I want to let us close singing a hymn, that in front of you, we have Live into Hope. Um, and I don't know if you, this is a, one of your hymns. I hope it is that you might know it. There you go. Um, you guys got one? And we'll put the words up on the screen. And if I can leave us. But, um, hope okay, that so we can do this. So please join me again in singing Live into Hope, all right? Live into hope of captives free, of sorry gain the end of grief. The oppressed shall be 
A vision of our God brought near, live into hope of liberty, the right to see, the right to be, the right to have a voice and to hear God's word and thus be fed. Live in hope of captain's free from shame to fear or want or grief. God now proclaims our beliefs to faith and hope and joy and peace. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You are awesome. It's been great to be with you. And next week, Char will be here working with you on you and the pandemic. Yeah. So then that may help with some of your questions too about you. Okay. Beautiful. When is the uh, when is your seminar again? Um next uh, seminar is Greer, the one that you just met Roy John that's going to be here the, with the Greek group. Yes. Well, so oh, you're is the Greek group. Yeah, oh. there'll be one starting this Thursday. Oh, I see. Yes. I was uh, yes. uh, 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 nice. Well, I don't know if I would I don't think I um qualify for a good group. I think I'm qualifications for a green group. Well yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking it was more a seminar thing for okay. anyone. Okay. It's, it's about someone who's lost from a course. Yeah. yeah. Although well, that's a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for all your comments. Oh, it was great. It was great. Okay. Okay.